And a good morning to you, everyone. This is Russ Barkley here again with another Saturday morning research update on research findings published during the past week on ADHD that I felt were particularly interesting or at least worth commenting on anyway. Today, we've got five studies to review. Uh, but before we do, as always, we've got another dad joke for you. I love dad jokes because they involve wordplay and I'm a big fan of wordplay. So, so here's your joke. What does a rabbit need after getting caught in the rain? You really ought to get this one. What does he need? A hair dryer. <laughs> All right, that's bad enough. So let's not ruin your weekend here. Um, first of the five studies up is a review that was published in a Spanish journal. And this review is a, excuse me, it's not a review, it's actually a research study, pardon me. Uh, and it is a study comparing children with autism spectrum disorder and children with ADHD and looking at the effects of sleeping problems on their communication skills. So I highlight it not only because uh, of its uh, international nature, but also because I thought the results were kind of interesting. Now, the study did find that both ASD and ADHD cases had higher rates of sleeping difficulties. That's not really new. What they did find in this comparison is that the ADHD kids had more difficulties with sleep breathing problems and with a condition of excessive perspiration during sleep known as hyperhidrosis. So even compared to the kids with ASD, the ADHD kids had significantly more of those specific problems, but both groups had a higher rate of sleeping difficulties than the typically developing kids. Now, the second thing, and I thought was even more interesting about this study, is that it also found that the extent of the sleeping difficulties was related to the degree of communication problems that the groups had during the daytime, of course so that they found that indeed degree of sleeping difficulties partially mediated the relationship between symptoms of the disorder and their communication difficulties. So they're suggesting that both of these groups, when they're seen clinically, not only be screened for sleeping difficulties, but also that people be aware that the extent of the sleeping difficulties might be partly affecting how they communicate with others and how much difficulties they have. So uh, a very fine study there that I thought was very interesting. Okay, let's move on to study number two. This one is a meta-analysis on the safety and effectiveness of a variety of antioxidant therapies that are popular for ADHD in children and adolescents. So it's a meta-analysis and they found 48 studies involving 12 different antioxidants. And they, add, they analyzed them uh, all together and found that the most effective of these antioxidants were the omega-3, the pycnogenol, which is an extract of pine tree bark, and vitamin D. Now, they did find that these had effects on symptoms of ADHD that were about one third to one fourth of what you would get with medication. So at least on the first pass through the studies, it looks like these agents might have a small degree of effectiveness. However, in the conclusions of the study, the authors report that the rigor of the research in this area is very poor for the most part, and therefore one cannot say much about the reliability or even validity of these findings. And that's my assessment of this literature as well. The studies are not very well done. There could easily be other explanations for the results that they're getting. Many times it's just giving the substance and assessing the effects before and after treatment. That's not a very good research design and so on. So at this point, although it looks like there's a little bit of promise for a few of these antioxidants, it's not much, and it needs a lot more rigorous research before I would be recommending these agents 
for managing ADHD. And certainly, they're nowhere near as effective as medication or even the other behavioral or psychosocial based treatment programs. So that was a study that was published over in plus one. Now, third up is a study published in a journal called Value in Health. This is also a meta analysis. And as you know, meta analysis is not just a review of the literature, they actually get the data from a variety of studies and therefore are able to combine them into one much larger data set and then conduct analyses on the results to see what are the mo most robust findings across these studies. Now, this particular review had 32 studies that they were able to include in their analysis, and they're looking at the cost of ADHD in children on families and society. And what they found is that the cost difference between kids with ADHD and typical kids averaged about $4,200 US per year. We've known for a long time that ADHD is an expensive disorder. This is just yet another review that echoes that in showing that the expense is rather substantial. Have a look at my other lecture on my YouTube channel that deals with the economic impact of ADHD on families and society. But here's yet another review that demonstrates that this is an expensive disorder, both for families and for governments and society. So uh, a nice review there uh, in value in health. Okay, next up is a study that compared children with ADHD to children and teens with ASD, Autism Spectrum Disorder, uh, and it was looking at their social functioning. Now, it used both an interview that collects information about social functioning, and it also used a lab task in which the individuals were observed while they interacted with their peers. And what this study reported was that in comparing these three groups, they found that the ADHD children and teens had significantly more problems in the lab test in performing social interactions. In contrast, the children and teens with ASD had much more problems with social perception and with some aspects of social knowledge. That kind of fits with what we know about these two disorders. ADHD, as you know, is a performance disorder. It's doing what you know, and there are difficulties in executing your social knowledge during interactions with others. So it's not a problem with knowing how to act, but with using that knowledge for social effectiveness. ASD, on the other hand, as we know, is a substantial problem with not just relating to others, but with social perception, emotional perception, and as they found here in the individual's social knowledge. So uh, a very nice study there. Um, this was in the Journal of Clinical Child and Adolescent Psychology. Okay, last up in our review for this Saturday is going to be another uh, very large study on the relationship of ADHD with a sleeping problem known as restless leg syndrome. Now, along the way, these investigators also looked at the relationship of peripheral iron content to see whether it had any relationship with the onset of either disorder or with the severity of either disorder. As you know, uh, iron content, both in brain and in blood, is sometimes found to be related uh, to these disorders, at least in a subset of cases. So uh, this study used very large data sets. It's, this is out of China. And it found that in looking at the genetics of ADHD and of RLS, it found that while there was little evidence for RLS having a genetically causal effect on ADHD, so the genes for RLS weren't necessarily predicting an increase in risk for ADHD, the opposite, however, 
was found, and that is that genes for ADHD were found to have a causal relationship to RLS. Now, we've known that restless leg syndrome is increased in its occurrence in individuals with ADHD. This very large study of genetics suggests that there may be a causal link between the two from ADHD to restless leg syndrome. By the way, they did find that while the peripheral iron content in blood was not related to the onset of these disorders, it did appear to be related to the severity of the symptoms of the disorders, particularly restless leg syndrome, not so much ADHD. So they're suggesting that reduced serum ferritin levels, reduced serum iron levels might be related to RLS, but not necessarily to ADHD, suggesting that when you see people with ADHD and RLS, you might want to investigate their serum iron levels uh, and obviously supplementation of that where there are deficiencies in iron levels. So uh, a very nice study there as well. Well, I hope you found this review of your weekly research interesting. As always, uh, if you like the channel, please subscribe. If you're not a subscriber, we're nearing 82,000 subscribers. Hard to believe that that's in less than a year and closing in on nearly 2 million views in the first year this channel has been operating, which will be in May, of course. So uh, thank you all for supporting this channel. Recommend us to others if you think they have an interest in ADHD. Uh, and thanks for viewing these research updates each week. All right, everybody, take care and be well.